Lord. Is this working? No? Okay. No, it should be working. It should play. All right. Uh, well, the clock, so I have how long? Fifteen minutes? Three, four minutes. Okay. <coughs> so please uh, stop me if you have any questions. Uh, thank you, Dimitri, for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. I have been to Rio and Sao Paulo and Campinas and so on, but never to the north. Uh, you're the exact opposite of Puerto Rico in the whole thing. So, so I'm in the north, you're in the south, but the same weather. So it's uh, you're flattered, but, uh, but I don't like that too much. Uh, so I asked Dimitri, uh, what kind of an introduction should I give? Things I said, oh, give an introductory lecture where you introduce what a protein is. So something that I thought of doing is to draw a protein and to draw a nucleic acid and ask you which one is which. And then I will tell who are the theoretical physicists in the audience and who are they. <laughs> so I'm real. I, I used to be a theoretical physicist, so I know. Uh, I, we can make jokes and stuff, so, so that's uh, legal what we do. Uh, so what I decided to do is to give an introduction and if you feel it's way too elementary, I can up it up a little bit. And then uh, if you think it's completely trivial, then I can use the word and, and go into some other details of what's the physics behind uh, what you're doing and probably some variations if, if that's what you want. But it might be better to actually do it at the informal setting where you just get into a room uh, and do that. So what I want to give is a brief introduction introductory lecture on the modeling of bulk molecules, different methods that can be used, uh, or, or different methods that we have used. So in my view, what is molecular modeling? Uh, there are multiple versions of this. So uh, for many people, molecular modeling is they get into a graphics computer and they play with the molecule and change angles and so on until they get the shape they like. And that's a model. And then they try to dock one protein with another. Uh, that is heavily used uh, in the dock industry. It has become more sophisticated with doing what is called docking programs, and then they put uh, uh, functions that they actually optimize to get a better uh, representation. Uh, these are not energies. Uh, they are sort of knowledge-based type things. At the end, you can reproduce and replace them for another view. So this is what I call here the other views. I don't do that. So if you need somebody to talk to you about that, I try to get somebody who's, uh, uh, who, who actually uses that uh, for the research. So there are other uh, two areas that I consider more interesting is you want to know how biomolecules work, how do they function, and then uh, from physical principles, and you hammer the physical principle here and there because you actually have to make approximations in many instances, the approximations are well justified. In other instances, they are just, physicists call it ansatz. We call it guesses. Uh, sometimes you just use some ansatz or, or uh, from the behavior of a very simple system, you assume a more complex system behaves the same way. And then you can solve equations or you can simulate the system. So what we want to understand is, uh, well, the behavior of, of molecule from physical principle uh, calculate thermodynamics, describe the dynamics, uh, look at folding, free calculation, self-assembly, kinetics, and so on. So this list can go on forever. They're experts uh, on many, many of the different areas. But always making connections to ex experiments. So it's not uh, just based on, on formalism. You always try to make comparisons to what's uh, measured. And then uh, you actually do a feedback where once you think you understand something, you tell some of your experimental colleagues and they go into the lab. And, and if you tell them, if you change this, the system is going to do that. And once in a while, you get it right. And then they do a second experiment until they prove you wrong, which is essentially whenever you have a model, that's exactly what you want. You want to be proven wrong to see how much 
the model actually describes the phenomena that you're interested in, and when it fails, then you find ingredients that are, that are missing. Once you find general phenomena, you don't have to simulate or model every single system. You don't have to do an experiment on every single system because there is general phenomena that you know you have identified or others have identified that is always going to be that way. Now you have to look at what are the exceptions. When does the system deviate from the general behavior? I'll try to bring up one or two cases where, uh, where that occurs. Uh, another way is to actually Uh, to, to, to determine a structural model using experimental data. Uh, and in some instances is that the proteins or the systems that you're dealing with are very complex. And you cannot, even from the experimental data, come out uh, with a structural model or a dynamical model of what's happening. So you actually help construct one uh, in the computer. And again, always tested uh, back and forth against experiments. This is all right. It behaves once in a while. So this is the, the two levels at which I consider molecular model modeling to be useful and in many instances interesting. I'm going to give an example uh, of FRET versus X-ray scattering. Uh, and this is an example from the literature. You're going to see many papers if you read the literature uh, of last month that there is back and forth who's right when you measure the size of a protein. There is a, a, uh, there is a technique called uh, for, uh, uh, fluorescence uh, resonance energy transfer that you have a, a fluorophore, you excite that fluorophore, and the energy is going to pass to another fluorophore if they are within a given distance. So you can actually do that as a, as a measure, as a ruler, and you can measure distances in a protein. And when you actually measure the size of a protein with FRET, you get one value. When you measure it with the small angle x-rays, you get another value. Who's right? Who's wrong? Okay. And, and they have been uh, back and forth, uh, uh, different groups doing uh, both. Recently, there was a paper that I cannot talk to, much less in, in being recorded, because uh, I may have seen it as a, on a confidential basis. Let's stop it there. They did both FRET and uh, uh, small angle x-rays and very much resolve, I think, what could be a, a what's actually happening and that measurements in most instances are right. What happens when measures, measurements are contradictory with each other? Uh, with, uh, so some of those contradictions come from interpretation rather than uh, from the phenomena that is being observed and this is one of those cases uh, that illustrates importance uh, of actually modeling, understanding theory, and understanding what are the limitations of the theories and when do different uh, theories apply and when, you, when, you, when they don't. So there is a many, many different uh, modeling approaches. Uh, there are some people, and I, and I put it here sort of in a hierarchy uh, in, in, in terms of uh, uh, precision and accuracy and so on. This might be uh, at the top. But then within these, there is many different approximations that can be, that are used. Uh, however, if you're going to do a system that self-assembles, that is large enough, uh, uh, folding of chromatin, folding of a RNA or DNA uh, large molecule, you cannot go here. It's just impossible. You're never going to uh, be able to actually describe the system, if you want to do a full calculation uh, of all the atoms and electrons and so on. Uh, so you end up doing models that actually discard a lot of the interactions because you consider they're not relevant. Uh, this is particularly useful when you see that multiple systems that are s completely different from one to another behave very similar. When that is the case, you don't have to put all the details to model that phenomena. Uh, you may actually uh, be able to use what is called coarse grain models and see what they uh, reproduce that phenomena and then start playing on how different interactions actually can drive the system one way or another. So these are two opposite levels. Uh, my work is mostly on this side, uh, not 
not from here on top. Uh, this is not that hard, depends on what the system is and what are the levels of approximation. But most of what I'm going to show you uh, is going to be on the molecular dynamics level uh, and then some coarse grain mod uh, models. And coarse grain models, again, it could be uh, statistically based models where you actually construct a potential uh, from the statistics of an all atom uh, more detailed model. Uh, so there is a uh, uh, ways of actually from statistical mechanics construct potential of link force that are uh, effective interactions that reproduce the distributions that you observe for the distributions in coarse grains. Uh, they are minimalist Go models. Uh, you are going to see next week, Jose Oruchik is going to describe uh, many of these models and I believe uh, there might be other representations of these. And these are really simple, uh, uh, what we'll call bare bones models that reproduce a lot of experimental data. So, and, and it can actually let you explore different aspects of, for, for example, protein folding, but it could also be of self-assembly that if you try to represent at this level, you just can't. Time scales are too long. Uh, the, the sizes of the system are too large. And then uh, the Go models can actually describe, uh, give a very good description of the system without actually going into all the details. And then there is the coarse grain force fields. These are force fields which are developed the same way as the molecular dynamics force fields. But for example, in the Martini version of it, every force atom is average into one atom. And then four water molecules is average into one water molecule. Uh, and, and, and then the interactions are reparametrized and rescale such that you get that representation of the system. But at the end, it's a force field, so it actually is not really a representation of what a molecular dynamics will give at a higher level of description. And then uh, this is not going to be exactly the same, while these methods actually uh, will do it because you reproduce the potentials that reproduce this, uh, the results in here, the distributions in here for a given set of conditions, temperature, pressure, and so on. These are just different models, simpler, and for the fact that they're simpler, they allow you to uh, examine self-assembly, for example, vesicles, lipid bilayers, uh, self-assembly of multiple, multi-protein complexes, and so on that otherwise you cannot even try uh, to start doing uh, at this level over here. So most of what I'm going to show you is going to be here and some of it uh, in here. No, I'm not going to show any QMMM. I don't do it personally. Uh, there are other methods that are being explored right now in part by my group uh, uh, and collaborations looking at phase uh, Phase field is one example, diffusion models where you actually uh, look at diffusion at one scale and once encounter complexes are formed, you look at those at another scale and, and you continue using multiple scales to describe, uh, say, binding uh, of two proteins. All right, so classical methods, that's all I'm going to show. I just cut everything that I had on the quantum mechanical methods because is I think this audience doesn't, I, I assume. There, there, there might be some people who care. Uh, some of the figures for this introductory lecture, uh, I stole from this person that I don't know, Give Ransom, from some lectures that he gave at some class. Uh, and uh, the animations disappeared because of the transferring from one machine to another. I assume they may actually work. So different types of simulation, I just show you that uh, if you do Go models, you can actually study, uh, this is a part, a piece of a circular DNA, 150 base pairs long, uh, and no water, nothing. Uh, and this is in, a, in an all atom uh, Go model. Uh, so I started my career looking for solitons. So I was a condensed matter theorist, uh, and there were much interest in, in solitons. I was in the early 80s. Most of you were not born at the time. And the problem that we end up, uh, we wanted to do 
uh, was to study the formation of bubbles and propagation of those bubbles along DNA. Bubbles, bubbles, yeah. The, the way DNA, uh, large DNA unfolds is not that the two strands come out completely separated. Uh, they start forming bubbles and then those bubbles you get in multiple sites and then the whole system goes, uh, it, it, it unfolds. But at the same time you have regions that are double-stranded, you have regions that are single-stranded. It's type of a second-order transition, not a first-order transition, which is what folding and folding kind of uh, becomes. So in a Go model, uh, I don't know if the, if the animation will work. My bet is that it's not going to work. Look. Uh, we actually, the pictures are on the web somewhere, the, the, the animations. Uh, you can simulate this and you see some regions will open up, form a bubble, and that bubble as notice that the system is heavily coupled because when you open a base pair and you form a bubble, you untwist, you have to untwist the, uh, the DNA and that when you form the bubble back, you have to retwist the DNA. So if, if you have a local twisting uh, excitation, when you untwist here, you have to twist somewhere else. Uh, so to, because it's circular, so everything is coupled to everything else. And then you see the bubbles opening it up and as the system goes through and forms base pairs, the bubble opens up everywhere. And you see it traveling one way, and then it travels the other way until it forms back. So these are excitations that are super, super cool, and you can actually see it on a molecular dynamic simulation. In the 1980s, we were trying to do this analytically, and the DNA was aligned with a, <laughs> uh, with a 5 4 type potential and things like that. Uh, but you can see phenomena like this that you cannot do atomistically with a realistic potential. You just do uh, what is called an all atom uh, go models. <laughs> You're trying to trap me into that. Yeah. Uh, I have two confirmations. One confirmation is double, double stranded. Uh, the other confirmation, the bases are open. And then it extends for about uh, a whole turn. So it's going to uh, the, the, the molecule twists like this and it's going to underwind and open up. And then this underwinding uh, gets propagated. And then for the system to come back, rewinds and then puts the excitation somewhere else, puts the, the distortion somewhere else. So it's a 5-4 it's a type domain wall type of traveling. Uh, not really because we never showed that the velocity of propagation has anything to do with the amplitude or anything like that. It's it's just uh, a phenomenon that actually could occur. Uh, so if you want uh, to put the DNA to interact uh, with a protein that, for example, will copy this DNA, you have to unwind and locally create a bubble, and then you can, cre uh, you can make a copy uh, of, of the DNA. So the formation of those bubbles have always been postulated as being an intermediate step. Uh, from the current chemistry that people look at it, uh, uh, there is the dot, 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 a miracle occurs, it opens, and the protein actually binds. So the detailed mechanism on how it happens is not there. Most likely it's not this either. This is just a physical model that says if I have two ropes and I pull on one side, the other side is going to unwind, more or less. Ah, yeah, in, yeah, yeah, yeah. The bubble model for DNA melting is from the 1950s and 60s. So people used to do it analytically. So it's equivalent to the same drag type models. So uh, the, the measurements that, uh, but these are kilobases DNA, and, and, and their measurements that show, for example, uh, DNA also has circular dichroism, and you can see that while still having a double helix, uh, part of it melts. So these are 
the ribbon inter interaction triples called melting and pre-melting. So it, it, it essentially it creates these bubbles, it creates multiple of these bubbles. It's not a real, you cannot describe it as a real phase transition because, uh, well, you could if you take into account that everything interacts with everything. But if you have finite range, you should not have, strictly speaking, you should not have, you should not have phase transition. It is thermodynamics. No, no, it's uh, thermodynamics. It's not, yeah. yeah. So I, I can go back to the literature on these melting uh, papers in bulb polymers from the 60s. So there is a, and, and there are even IC models that people created to explain the data and what was going on. So that was, yeah. All right. So classical mechanics. So this is the molecular modeling of biomolecules where you actually have atoms and you're going to have hydrogens and you're going to have interactions uh, between these atoms and these interactions uh, it can have potential energy functions that you can write many different ways and even though uh, people say it's too cumbersome and too ugly or whatever especially from the physics point of view I think it's as simple as possible <laughs> it's uh, to make it uh, it actually the deficiencies of the potential may actually come from the fact that it's too simple. It misses some interactions, it misses some couplings, but that's good enough uh, because I'm going to describe this kind of potential. Some of you may get bored because you have already know it or you have done it, but you don't care. Uh, that's okay. So molecular model. So we're going to have atomistic position for the particle. We're going to put... Uh, energy, kinetic energy into the system. Uh, each atom has a, what is called a partial charge. So the net charge of the system is whatever the net charge of the molecule is. Those charges are fixed. That's the difference between quantum mechanics or using polarizabilities or just a simple fixed charge model. So that's one of the strongest approximation which seems to be good enough. Uh, it depends on the phenomena, then you may have to put uh, other terms. Uh, if you have ionization, that the uh, uh, protons are released or, at or, or attracted due to pH changes, this is, this is not going to do it because not only the charges will not be fixed, the atoms will not be fixed. A lot of atoms could go and come and go. We don't have that. And then bond information. Uh, uh, bonding, bending. And the hidden angles, let me just show you really, really uh, uh, how does it looks. So <laughs> there's some equations there you cannot see, but you can write them in your sleep, right? Uh, so this is force equal mass time acceleration. Force is the gradient, the divergence of the potential. And the, 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 uh, the, the, the force is equal to mass times the second derivative. And that's the that you're going to solve and you're going to solve it uh, iteratively with a very small integration step. Uh, so let's talk about the potential really quickly. So the non-bonded atoms, non-bonded terms. Uh, sorry for this. It's, uh, I think the keynote conversion put yellow into those equations. They, they were black in, in my PowerPoint. So they're non-bonded terms. So these are atoms that are not bonded. They fill Van der Waals potentials. And that's just a 612 potential. Uh, notice that it could actually be a whole series of, uh, uh, well, the Coulombic is 1 over R. There will be 1 over R uh, uh, cube, 4, uh, 6, and so on. But those terms are essentially, as a matter of approximation, they're, they're forgotten. So all you have is a London term, which is 1 over R to the 6, attractive, and then 1 over R to the 12. Uh, and the real history of 1 over R to the 12 is very deep. It's the square of 1 over R to the 6, period. Right? Uh, there is no real physical uh, uh, reason why it should be 1 over R to the 12, but it's a way of representing Pauli exclusion principles. Electrons will repel each other if you compress them. And 1 over r to the 12 is good because if you calculate 1 over r to the 6, you square it and you're done. Uh, so, uh, and then there is electrostatics. Electrostatics, uh, everywhere is written like 1 over r. 
is one over our plus boundary conditions. So the plus boundary conditions can actually make the problem hard when you're dealing with systems and solution. Otherwise, it's a straightforward. So, uh, and this is where the origin of the Van der Waals term is. Essentially, this is just the London term, the first term in here. And then the second term is the one over R to the 12. That is just a made up. Uh, the R to the, the potential is here, but you, you can see it. You don't need, uh, is, this, uh, is this a legit uh, blackboard? Can I write it? All right. So the Van der Waals. I don't know, it has a, a quadr you know, it's divided into nice things, you know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't want to be told you wrote on the wall, you know, that's, yeah. So. Most of you should know this, so this potential looks like this, uh, this is sigma, this is epsilon, and this is a very much one over r to the 12. Uh, we have one over r to the 6. I look over here. That's an, that's an attractive term. So the combination between those two terms gives you this van der Waals. Uh, so you just have to figure out what this is, and you figure out what that is. Uh, You can use crystal structures, you can use energy calculations, you can use many different ways to determine this parameter, or you just can take them uh, from high resolution crystal structures. Uh, that's exactly what I said here. And then the electrostatics. So the electrostatics, Sorry for the high energy physics in the audience. You don't use this. <laughs> Life is simpler without it. Uh, but when you have to remember units, it is, it's easier to put it like this. And this is just if you have two particles with a given charge at a given distance, this is the interaction. So in a calculation, this is what costs the most. So if you're not smart enough, uh, if you just... Uh, do the calculation without using any approximations or whatever, this is of order n square. If I have a protein, just made it up, these are the atoms. Every atom is gonna interact with every other atom. So that's an n square term. Uh, and that's what it costs to do this. In reality, in a system, and in a system, in addition, you have solvent or whatever. So this could be the most expensive term uh, in your calculation. I'm going to show you the other terms that are order n. So if you have n atoms, you have order n uh, of these terms. This, uh, in periodic boundary conditions and so on, uh, you can do what is called an equal summation, and it's order n log n which is great, and if the system is large enough, you can actually consider a cutoff, you consider a, a, a range under which these interactions become below whatever your noise level is, and this becomes order n. So this dominates, so this, any calculation you do is n log n in general. All right, Coulomb's law is there. Combine them, just add these two terms. And then comes the order n terms. So the bond lengths, you have a molecule, there is a bond. This is a chemical bond, and this bond can form and break in reality. But in these models, it's fixed. It, it, it can vibrate, and when you let it vibrate, you put a quadratic potential. You actually don't put a Morse potential, which is the appropriate uh, potential, you just take the the well the, the depth of the potential. So uh, a Morse potential should actually well it doesn't matter if I make it. 
make a different mass. It's a lot, like the Van der Waals is much deeper, it has a different shape. And in here, you can say it's just quadratic with a force constant. So in the molecular dynamic simulations and all methods that you use, you actually assume the potential is like this. That's a easy uh, approximation. In many calculations, you actually fix it uh, with like nice multipliers and you don't even let it vibrate. Uh, this is what currently we do. It allows you to integrate at three, four femtoseconds. If you let that vibrate, you have to integrate at a quarter to half femtosecond uh, time steps in the molecular dynamics. A big, big game by actually constraining that. Bond angles is essentially, oh, this is bond lengths. Uh, bond angles is the stretching. So these uh, two red atoms in here, uh, they're supposed to, they can actually do this. And they, these are very strong constraints, so they don't move quite a bit, but they oscillate a little bit. So that's a bond angle term. And the same, you assume the potential. It's called the bond angle term. You assume it goes. This should be zero. Uh, zeta minus zeta naught square, where zeta is the angle, uh, for example, between these three terms in here. And then there is another term that is the dihedral term. So the dihedral term is, so if I have atom one, two, three, four, uh, I can move the arms relative to another. So three atoms form a plane, and then I go above the plane or below the plane. There is, a, there is an angle that is the, uh, very much the angle between the plane by these three atoms and the plane between these three, uh, three other atoms. And, and that's the torsional potential. So when you go into the literature, you're going to see amber force field, amber force field with 20 names after it, charm, 18, 22, 27, 36, uh, OPLS, and so on. All they do is to change distance very much. So from, from the family of charm, charges are determined one way. From the family of amber, charges are determined another way. From OPLS, they determine this simulating pure neat liquids. And everybody's told their parameters, and that's what the others are going to use, more or less. But the dihedral angles is the variation. So when you see amber uh, 99, ni amber 94, amber 99, uh, 99SB, 99SB, ILDN, and it, 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 it keeps adding up very soon, uh, the name of the, of the potential is going to be longer than the thousand parameters that are in there. And all they're changing is these parameters. Uh, so uh, these are sensitive parameters. Some people can these parameters by doing ab initio, molecular dynam mo uh, ab initio calculations, uh, quantum mechanical calculations. The problem is that these are the rock under which you throw the dirt, right? So when you do a quantum mechanical calculation, uh, they don't understand that this sigma is there, much less the sigma that you decided to put in. When you fix the charges, quantum mechanics doesn't know that the charges are not supposed to be fixed, so they're going to charge, they're going to change. And then everything in your potential energy function that was restrained by the approximation you're doing, you put it here. Right? It's, uh, you know, if the energy is too high, you put a term that has a barrier. It's very much n, n equal to be one, two, three, people have tried four. That's a Fourier series. Uh, so you take the difference between the detail calculation and the model calculation, and you adjust the parameters until you get them, more or less. And then there are intelligent ways of doing it, and that's the difference uh, between the different force fields. And there are uh, uh, practical ways of doing it, uh, which is what the ILDN comes from. Uh, in, in the show group, they could actually do very low molecular dynamic simulations, and they found that the distributions were not what they were from experiments. So they tweak them, they reproduce, they try again, they tweak them again, 
until they say this reproducive experiment less than the parameter. And that's a very expensive way of doing it because they end up doing probably hundreds of microseconds of simulations, which is more than anyone uh, can do just to adjust the parameter. And then they can do uh, millisecond uh, molecular dynamic simulations. So that's the energy potential. Uh, it's simple enough. Uh, it has many parameters. So uh, for every bond type, you have a parameter here. For every angle type, you have a parameter here. Uh, for every four atoms, you have a parameter here. Uh, mostly they're grouped. For example, for the bond, for the bonds depends on what kind of bond it is. If it's a carbon, carbon, carbon oxygen, or whatever, each one of them has a different force constant. They each one of them has a different uh, equilibrium value. For the, for the angles here, uh, very much you can just look at who's in here at the center and, and use that atom as a reference for this one. And then in this one, many of the angles values are zero. Uh, you just choose uh, some of the parameters in particular for the backbone. They're fitted, the others are not fitted. The van der Waals are very much fixed. So people have taken values from the literature from X-ray crystallography and kept those. There's slight changes that you can make here and there by a few percentage. And then the Coulomb charges are based on quantum mechanical or good instinct. And, and the two versions have been used. And for many years, good instinct won over quantum mechanics. People now do it more robustly uh, with quantum mechanics such that uh, from different groups doing the same protocol, they can get charges that are uh, reasonable with that. So all these terms are order n, so that's straightforward. Uh, these terms are this with approximations is order n, and this is lo order n log n. Uh, and n here is the trick to use this. n has to include solvent ions and so on. So n could be 10,000 to 100,000 to a million. Uh, for n log n, uh, essentially you can forget this log is order n, so it's pretty fast. And here is the, the algorithm. Uh, so given x positions and velocities, calculate the force uh, from this potential, calculate the derivative given the coordinates, uh, integrate the equation of motion, and do it again. Uh, so if you integrate at a femtosecond, uh, you can do a thousand steps, you have a picosecond, you do a thousand steps, you have a a nanosecond, you do a thousand steps, you have a microsecond, you do a thousand steps of that, you have a millisecond. So you can do 10 to the 12 integration steps uh, or, or the order of that. So it's, it could be, uh, that's why in here I show this, uh, this is 2004, five. this is a blue gene computer, it was a super duper computer, now you can have it under your desk. All right. So Berlay algorithm is what is actually used. It's very simple. Oh, it doesn't show up. Oh, well. Look at it on the web. Uh, it's essentially finite differences. So given uh, if, if you have, uh -oh. <laughs> yeah. So you, you have the position at time t plus delta t. That's what you want to calculate. Given that you have the, the position at time uh, t, uh, so the, the, the new position is going to be uh, uh, the position plus the velocity times delta t plus one half uh, the acceleration times delta t square, uh, t cubed, t fourth, and so on. So order t4 error here. And now you take r to t minus delta t. You have everything the same except that this term is negative. Here it was positive. This is positive and positive. This is positive. This is negative. So... Uh, add them up. Mm, okay. So if you add them up, you have R, uh, R of T plus delta T plus R of T minus delta T. So you're here, you look where you were in the previous time step, and now you can predict where you're going to be in the next time step. And it's going to be twice the position now plus the acceleration times delta t uh, square plus order delta t to the fourth. So here is the error, is delta t to the fourth. And you can do more sophisticated things if you keep higher and higher order derivative, but you don't want to calculate the higher and higher order derivative because this is expensive.
this is the order n type calculation. Uh, so this is the error here. And if you want to calculate uh, the velocity, uh, you can, oh, from here you get what the position is uh, with an order, error of order t to the fourth. And then when you want to calculate the velocity, uh, you're going to get, it's not here, uh, you're going to get error of, t of order uh, uh, delta t square. So velocities are awful, uh, positions are good. Uh, so position is what matters, velocity you mostly notice that here you don't use velocity anywhere to predict what the positions are, uh, but uh, kinetic energy and so on are based on, on velocities. So pros of the Verlet algorithm, this was developed in the 1950s uh, or early 60s uh, by Verlet. Uh, and it's simple and effective. Uh, it's a, you just calculate the force once, you don't need to calculate the force uh, multiple times. It's time reversible, so if you integrate plus delta t or minus delta t, you get the same, you can tr trace the trajectory backward or forward, which is actually uh, the physics equation of motion, half that, so that's important. And, uh, and it's very stable, and it conserves energy, uh, yeah, if, if you do time stays <laughs> short uh, enough. So there is another method called Runge-Kutta, that is a higher order uh, approximation, is, a, is, is what is called a predictor corrector method, and, uh, and, and with the, with the, uh, with the Runge-Kutta you can get much higher precision, but it's not time reversible, doesn't conserve energy, so doing a higher order approximation doesn't guarantee that you're going to do better physics, so that's not, uh, it's not very good. Uh, another con of the Verlet algorithm is you never calculate velocity, and sometimes we need them, so there is a velocity, Verlet, and so on, there are other algorithms. So this is the basics. Uh, notice that all we have used here is physics 101, elementary physics to know what the motion of a particle is, and then do integration steps that are very small, so you can, uh, uh, yes. The leapfrog is, ve is very similar algorithm, right? So in one you use the velocity, in the other, or the, or the velocity Verlet. So they're, they're very similar. Yeah, I don't have our heads on this. You can go into the work and do that. And yeah. It's, it's a, uh, the issue is what do you want to calculate and what information you want to use for, for doing it. So in the, for example, the leapfrog is a better method for when you have constraints. So if, if I say uh, distance between two atoms does not change, uh, the leapfrog allows me to maintain that constraint in a simple way, while in, in, in the Verlet it's much more difficult. So you violate the constraint, then you put a force, then brings it back, and then you take it back. So that's, at the end, the two algorithms are very similar. I believe leapfrog and Verlet have the same error and positions. Uh, it's a long time since I, it's a longer time since I studied, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, so let's do a couple problems. Uh, physics of protein folding, I think Diego is going to do it for reals. I'm just going to give a very, uh, so this is the kind of work we actually do. Uh, so we, we want to use computation and theoretical methods to study biological system. And like I said at the beginning, uh, we're, we're interested in understanding some chemical and physical principles. Uh, and uh, <laughs> to some degree, this is how we do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so this was me at the beach yesterday. I, I had too, more too many fajuadas. Uh, so that's what you have now. And these are examples of proteins, not these, the complexity. So this is a, a muscle is made out of uh, these fibers, uh, and, and this, these fibers will contract and expand, and that's function. That's fun uh, uh, we don't go there at all in our simulations, but this is how complex uh, uh, a, a protein complex could be. Uh, I have heard Jose make the joke that, uh, you know, these are just these protein fibers 
uh, they facilitate motion, and better of all, it tastes well. Right? This is meat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and here is a ATPA synthase. This is a machinery that actually uh, converts, it's a molecular machine, and it actually, it, it works the inverse. It takes a gradient, a proton gradient, and from that proton gradient, uh, it synthesizes ATP and stores that energy into ATP. Then ATP goes into the cell and binds to whatever hydrolyzes ATP and releases that energy. So this is the uh, fuel plant uh, for the cell uh, in the sense that it's creating all this ATP. And then the ATP is released like uh, alcohol in your case uh, in the tank of your car uh, to drive around. So notice this is a multiple protein, multi-protein complex, really complex, uh, and there are illustrations of it turning around as it actually uh, converts the, the, uh, the proton gradient into motion and that motion into chemical energy, and then the chemical energy is actually uh, released, and that's what drives a lot of the biological system. So what's a protein? I don't know. Everybody knows this. No, I'm not going to embarrass those of you who are theoretical physicists. I was going to draw a nucleic acid and a protein backbone next to each other. And then uh, those who raised their hand when they said this is the nucleic acid uh, and implies that I should explain this in more detail. Uh, and if everybody knew, I didn't have to. Uh, so it's a chain. It's a linear chain. It has very few cross-links mostly an exception when you have the cross links. So in principle, it's a, it's a string that you could pull and it comes back uh, when unfolded. Uh, and then uh, this is called the backbone very much because uh, this region in here is called the peptide bond. So there is a C, uh, C alpha. There is a side chain that goes in here. So there are 20 types of side chains. One of them is just a hydrogen, that's glycine, which is the most, the simplest. Uh, the most complicated is tryptophan, it's a double ring type uh, molecule. Uh, and there's some of them are positively charged, some of them are negatively charged. Uh, some of them are polar in the sense that they like to interact with water. Some of them are hydrophobic, they don't like to interact with water or it costs energy for them to interact with water. And then, uh, the next unit has the same thing. So this is the peptide bond in here. Uh, this bond rotates freely. This bond rotates freely. This bond is a double bond. It doesn't rotate as well. Uh, it can rotate, uh, but we don't care too much about it. Uh, there are instances when it actually is part of the function of the system to actually rotate that bond. Uh, but these are the exceptions, not, not necessarily the, the rule. So it's there, it's relevant in some instances, but it's not always relevant. Uh, it can actually, this, this is called cis-trans isomerization. It can slow down folding. Uh, there are some folding events that could take seconds because of this uh, rotation of this angle could be very slow. Rotation of these angles are very fast. Uh, so this will be in the picoseconds time scale uh, in a disordered system. And then you make a chain that is going to have 100, 150 is the typical size of a protein. It can be thousands of amino acids long. Uh, one of the amino acids is a cysteine. Cysteine can actually make what is called a disulfide bond and brings two groups together, and that's a covalent bond. And that changed the nature of the chain a bit. And, and the behavior of the system uh, as a polymer can actually change. So. Depending on these two angles that I said it can rotate, so this is called phi, this is called psi. Uh, so if I plot the energy, energy contours of one angle versus the other, uh, this region in blue in here uh, is the region where the protein is going to form alpha helices. So it has a given uh, 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 twist. It's going to make hydrogen bonds. Uh, so the CO in here, the carbonyl in here, is going to make hydrogen bonds uh, with NH groups farther away, typically three, four amino acids away. It could be even, even longer, depends on if it is alpha helices or beta sheets or whatever you have. Even in disorder system, it can form that. 
this region in here is a left-handed helix. So one is right-handed, the other is just left-handed. Uh, it's a much narrower region. Almost everything else in here are regions that if you choose these angles, the atoms are going to sit on top of each other. So they are excluded mostly. Uh, in simulations, it's a problem because they're supposed to be excluded, uh, but the bond angles stretch a little bit or the bonds becomes a little bit longer and releases that. So the, the area that you get is bigger than actually than it should be. And then this region in here forms beta sheets. So mostly beta sheets are on this corner over here. Uh, something called polyproline 2 will be in this, this corner over here. Uh, so if you look at the some papers by Rohit Papu and George Rose, I believe this is separated like in seven different regions of different structures that can actually form. So it's not just a blob. Uh, it has some long-range interactions that can form structures over there. So that's the secondary structure of a protein. So when you hear that people say it's an alpha helix protein, it's because it mostly occupies this. It's an alpha beta, it's because it occupies those. And there are 2,000 folds, so they have different combinations of alphas and betas and, and so on. And then disordered regions could be anywhere, uh, mostly uh, in this region over here. So, the spherical cow. So the, the uh, physicists always make a model where everything is simple. Uh, so let me tell you what is the spherical cow model for a protein. Uh, so what is a spherical cow? It's a cow that is a spherical and uh, uh, is homogeneously filled with milk. So if you want to know what is it, you can calculate the density of milk and you know how much it weighs because the density should be the same. So the spherical cow uh, is very much polymer statistics. So when you have a system that is disordered, and let me put all the qualifiers here because it's relevant. Uh, so if I have a chain that doesn't form any secondary structures, and where the solvent in which that protein is immersed actually likes the side chains. So the side chains either interact well with that or it doesn't care how it interacts. It's very much neutral. So that's what it will be called a good solvent. Uh, so when, when you have those kind of conditions, assume that the side chains or the bits uh, in the protein are infinitesimally small, just points. If that is the case, what you have is a random walk. The, the chain can actually go in any direction. Uh, typically, this length in here should be what is called a persistent length. For proteins, it's about three to five amino acids long. Could actually be very close to one amino acid. Uh, and the chain is just going to it's a random walk. It's the drunken, uh, three-dimensional drunken person uh, walking around. And, and you can actually do the statistics. You can solve this model exactly. Statistical mechanics, you have done it. It's one of the homework problems you give or the, or the test that you give uh, on, on how to derive this. You can use uh, uh, maximum entropy. All you have is entropy. And this explains uh, the rubber band. So just elasticity of a system. So if you look at what is the probability that uh, this n, which is the beginning, and this n, which is the end, what is the n to n distance, you can actually, uh, for a random walk, it's just a Gaussian distribution. Uh, it has a prefactor in here, but what is important is this term in here that tells you the distance, r, divided by 2n squared. So right away you get uh, that the probability of this end-to-end -end distance is going to be uh, uh, n to some number. And typically, that number is one half. It's the square root for, for the real random walk. Uh, the radius of gyration uh, is going to be what's the mean square displacement uh, of the atom from its center of mass. So instead of the end-to-end -end distance, is you just figure out what the center of mass is and calculate the distance between all atoms and that center, and also scales like square root of n. So that's just a random polynomial, just elastic uh, band. 
So that's a spherical cow uh, model for a protein. Uh, it's also called a random call. So when people say the system unfolded, they will immediately say it went into a random call. The unfolded state is a random call. Not quite. What are the problems? The problems are chain the, the, the sites are not infinitesimal. They occupy space. So once you have a amino acid in a given position, the chain can fluctuate, but another amino acid cannot occupy that position. So that will be uh, uh, a self-avoiding walk, which is different than a random walk. And in a self-avoiding walk, you actually get an exponent of 350.6. And this might be closer to what the unfolded state should behave like uh, if you could actually change the number of amino acids. And then in a, in a theta solvent, it means a bad solvent. It's a solvent in which the system uh, is going to, uh, uh, sorry, here, the, the, the system is going to repel to the solvent, so the system attracts to itself and it collapses. Uh, and then the radio association is going to be new to the one probe. So I bring this, and I mentioned at the very beginning the, the controversy between FRET and, uh, and small angle X-ray scattering. Four minutes left. Uh -huh. At least I sh show you something that is in the literature, in the recent literature. So what this says is that the R, and I'm going to call it N, N to N distance, that's the P of R in here. Uh, it's going to be n, let's say, to the one half from the random coil, and the r of g is going to be n to the one half, different prefactors, and you can actually take one versus the other, and uh, this will give you six, <laughs> the number uh, between the two. So what Fred does, people take a protein. And then they can put labels at different ends. And this is a really uh, ugly type label. I'm making it like this. That uh, it has excited electronic states. So you take light, uh, typically in the visible. You find out what the resonance of absorption of this one is, to be 490 uh, nanometers. And then uh, you excite this uh, chromophore, and this chromophore is going to couple to that chromophore in something that has a dependence of 1 over r. And you put 1 over r to the 6. So it's a dipole-dipole coupling, and the energy gets transferred from one place to another. What you can do is that you can put a protein in solution, you put labels, and you can actually put labels at different sites, and then you know what the segment length between here is. If it is the ends, the segment length is n, the total number of amino acids in your system. If you choose between here and here, it could be n over 2. You can choose different value. And then you measure what's the probability that these groups are nearby, and some of them are going to be, ah, and the intensity depends on how close they are with a given resolution. They have to be uh, between 15 and 20 angstroms all the way to 40 angstroms. If they're closer, the interactions are completely different. You can actually not map. So from here, you can actually take a ruler and measure these distances. In reality, you're measuring these distances, and you can measure these distances. And then you can use the scaling theory and say, this is the distances between different ends. And based on that, you say the size of this protein is whatever, right? A, a given size. Uh, oh, from the Rn, you infer Rg, and that's the size of the protein. So here is the, here is the, the swiggle means you infer what the radio association is. Now you do small angle x-rays. You have the same protein. 
you send an X-ray beam, and that X-ray is going to scatter, and you get a something called a crack field plot, and you can look at the small cube approximation of it the, uh, uh, from the scattering. So you're going to get light coming out. And you're going to look at the small Q value, and from there, you get what the radius of, of the aeration of your system is. So for a small angle X-ray, very much you measure radius of the aeration. And the com problem is that these are not the same. They're of a factor of two or so. And people go, your measurements are wrong. No, your measurements are wrong. No, your analysis of small angle doesn't make sense. No, the sites here matter. It makes sense. And the issue is that this doesn't hold. When you have an unfolded state of a protein up, if you do this into a denaturant called urea, if you do it in presence of urea, they agree. If you do it under normal solvent, water, they don't agree. So the problem comes here. Water is not a good solvent. You're going to have some structures in your system. By having some structure in your system, end-to-end -end distance and radius of generation are not necessarily correlated. The fact that you know one doesn't tell you the other. And there is a paper should be out soon, I hope, in PNAS. At least one of the referees agreed with it because I thought it was fantastic. They actually did this. They did the X-ray of the protein with the chromophores because people said, oh, it's bigger here because you have the chromophores. And that's what you're measuring. It's all these ads and angstrom or so to the radius of generation. So very much settled the controversy quite reasonably. Uh, other people say, no, the, uh, the new for an unfolded protein in water is 3 -fifths. So that's Sosnik, he measures, he says, it's 3 fifths. Uh, he might be right. I don't know. And that's another version of this. So this is an area where you take the spherical cow model of a protein, and then you take data, sophisticated data, because this is not trivial. Uh, it's not trivial to prepare the molecule. It's not trivial to measure it. And then uh, you enter into this uh, controversy. So somebody will talk about intrinsically disordered proteins, and this is in the middle of these intrinsically disordered proteins. So there are many aspects. An unfolded protein may have secondary structure. Nothing says it cannot have alpha helix and beta sheets. There's no alpha helices and beta sheets here. Uh, so if you have alpha helices, you have things that have order at a much longer scale than the persistent length, mixed with things that have order at shorter lengths, and what's the actual value? Who knows? I mean, what's the scaling uh, for those? It could be simulated and you can model it, but most likely, depending on the content, you're going to get different values, so you're not going to get straightforward scaling loss uh, like this. So I think one hour, rules are rules. Questions? Yeah. Well, there is a whole theory of polymers, which is enormous, and there is all kind of sophistication on it. So it's, it's not hand-waving like I'm doing here. You can actually do real theory. Ah. 
this is not my work at all, but I know how to do it because it's very simple. So if I make a if if I make a polymer chain, I can make a go model type where at one level uh, the system is going to have whatever interactions I put there and fold, and then I can put change the nature of the solvent. So what I do is that I change the interactions between the bits. So I have a just a C alpha type model. Uh, at one level, say zero denaturant, uh, the bits are going to fill whatever interaction I have in the Go model and it folds. And now what I do is that uh, as I add denaturant, I start weakening the interactions for the particle among themselves and they just start repelling themselves. They, they just don't care. They just, they just become hard spheres. As soon as they become hard spheres, they will have the excluded volume, which is what I need to get this 0.6. Uh, and I can tune from something that collapses, which is what I need to get this one third, uh, to something that actually uh, will be all exposed. So I can have a, I, I can tune one parameter, and actually there is a program called AppSync that uh, Rohit Babu put together, and he can model on fold the states of real proteins by just putting the interactions of the side chains in the protein, all atoms, uh, such that they don't like each other at all. And then what you do is that you say, how many ways can I pack this structure at random? But it's a self-avoiding walk, and this is my unfolded state. And then uh, there are other programs that actually put not a hard sphere, but a little bit of an interaction, so they, they can adjust to experimental data. So it's a very simple model from the point of view of what are the interactions of the bit with the solvent. If the interaction of the bits with the solvent, if the bits like the solvent, I can make uh, the interaction of the bits with the solvent negative, essentially very favorable, and then everything is going to be open up and exposed to solvent as much as possible. The problem with that is that you can expand right, if, if they repel each other. Uh, another one is that they don't care, right? How do it interact with the solvent versus the interior doesn't care, except for the excluded volume. And that's, all, that's probably the best model for the unfolded state. If I wanted to model the, the urea denaturation, that's how I will do it and probably put a term that is surface area, actually, to do my life, have done this. Uh, it's just depending on surface area, and then uh, if you have urea, it actually likes to enhance the surface area that is exposed, and how much you actually can tune it with the amount of urea. So that will that will be one way. The 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 hard sphere type model, or a, or a model with a repulsive potential and a chain, people have done it in an analytically uh, doing normalization with fields. So uh, uh, Musa Kumar has done that, and you can actually get all these properties for something that has excluded volume, uh, something that has charges. You can even put charges into the system and get all kind of interesting phases. Uh, so you can go as sophisticated as you want, right? So uh, Muthu Kumar has spent all his life doing this kind of uh, renormalization with theory methods, uh, and, and, and he can tune. He's doing polymers, or he does DNA, uh, from the point of view that DNA is just, you don't care about the sequence, all you care is that the backbone is charged. It depends, you can go as sophisticated as you want. Yeah. Any other questions? The quiz is going to be this afternoon, <laughs> and you're supposed to. But they reproduce that too, because you have to have the solvent, right? So good enough. Good enough. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll show you. I mean, when Dimitri asked me to talk about proteins under extreme conditions, so I'm going to show folding on folding using atomistic simulations, uh, unfolding upon urea, unfolding upon pressure, 
and you can reproduce a lot of these properties. You can actually draw a phase diagram uh, where you have folder on folder as a function of pressure, actually gives you an ellips uh, ellipsoidal kind of diagram, which, which is measured, yeah, which is. So you don't need that. Now, w you're gonna see in the calculation when I showed you that I put pressure temperature to 500 degrees Kelvin. You know, temperature I changed from 270 to 550 degrees Kelvin, right? So 550 degrees Kelvin is, is not what you use in your lab to unfold the protein. And then pressure, I go from zero atmospheres uh, to 5,000, right? And 5,000 atmospheres, I mean, for a physicist, that's nothing, right? Because they put gigapascals, not megapascals. So uh, 1,000 atmospheres is 100 megapascals. Uh, uh, but the bottom of the ocean is, a, is 100 megapascals, more or less. However, the bacteria that live on geological formations, and there you have can you can have gigapascals. Now nobody has done measurements of the bacterium under gigapascals, but they live there, and and they can actually suffer this kind of pressure. Yeah. Order uh, KT. You know, if you if you take order KT at room temperature, that will be 0.6 K cal per mole or 2.4. The the issue is uh, you have the hydrogen bonding, uh, and a given hydrogen bond may give you 5 K cal per mole. Uh, that's about 11, 12 kilojoules per mole. I don't know which units to use. Uh, and then, however, when the bond breaks, it hydrogen bonds with water. So I had five, and now I have five minus 0.2, <laughs> right? So I don't lose all the energy. Actually, I may have five. That's, that's the, uh, but what I gain is the entropy of the system. So you choose temperatures at which the entropy and enthalpy are very well balanced. So if, if I will heat up the DNA to, 100 degrees C, it depends on what I use, probably will just unfold and precipitate and make a blob and, and go to the bottom of the, of the system that you have. Uh, but if I, if I increase it to 50 degrees, it might not be unfolded. It, it, it may actually have uh, partially unfolded. It could be 50% folded, which means that's the transition temperature. But at the transition temperature, it's not folded versus unfolded. That's a first order type transition. It's actually, uh, it's a, a combination of domains that are folded and, and domains that are unfolded. In, in a way, you can make the analogies to magnetic systems, if you're a physicist, that you can have a, a, a domain wall, uh, that you have two magnetization, the system can choose either one. And as you increase, uh, or it could be magnetized versus disorder, and as you increase temperature, uh, in this case, you can actually have uh, longer and longer domains that are disordered versus smaller domains that are ordered, and as you cool down, it goes the other way around. So that, that will be the analogy, rather than the two states that the system goes all into one or all into the other. So these are called all or none transitions. That those are first order type. Here is uh, all or some of it. <laughs> so, yeah. Good question. All right, so we're gonna be around the whole week and next week, so thanks. <laughs>